There we go. Thank you, Cindy. Peggy. <laughs> Some years ago, uh, back when we were in Charlotte, uh, early on actually in ministry, I was uh, asked to officiate at a wedding for a couple uh, within our church, and um, I'd done the premarital counseling for them, and they were having a location wedding in Charleston. Uh, those of you who are single uh, and are planning a wedding or uh, hope one day to have a wedding, let me just encourage you, don't do a location wedding. Oh, they're just the worst. Anyway, I say that because you gotta, everything has to be moved. You've got to get all that stuff wherever that is. And this was not just a location wedding. It was an outdoor wedding in Charleston. It's hot in Charleston really hot and really muggy everybody's sweating it's miserable anyway but this was where the wedding was to take place at a plantation in Charleston uh, on Mother's Day weekend and so um, I had agreed to do this and uh, so I needed to go down on Friday there was a rehearsal on Friday and then the wedding was going to be uh, late on Saturday afternoon early evening it was gonna be a dinner reception anyway Caroline has gone with me on this trip, and so we've done the rehearsal. On Saturday, uh, we get up, and we just uh, we kicked around Charleston, and I don't remember anything that uh, we saw of note, but just kind of killing time because there wasn't a whole lot that you could get really into because uh, by the time you could try to do something, it was time to, to get ready, uh, get out of the hotel, and get to the location. That was the other thing is that we needed to get checked out of the hotel, and they were gracious with us by letting us stay a little bit longer, I think, by like one or two we had to get all of our stuff out. And uh, as I recall, the wedding was to start somewhere in the 5 o'clock range, something like that. And so there was this, this window of time. And ultimately what we decided to do was to, to just get dressed and we would head towards uh, where the, the wedding was to be at this plantation. And we've got, from my account, a couple of hours uh, to play with. And so I had said to Caroline, maybe we can find an ice cream shop on the way. Now this is um, in the early 2000s, before, I mean the, the internet was around, but there was no such thing really as a smartphone at that point, certainly no mobile internet, and so uh, our, our maps are printed MapQuest directions. You remember those good days? Anyway, so I'm, I'm using my printed MapQuest sheets and uh, working our way towards uh, this plantation. And we're keeping our eyes peeled as every, every time you pass a little shopping center, is there a little ice cream store? And, and we didn't see anything. And the further we go, the more out of town we are getting. And there's, there's less and less stuff. And so finally I realized, you know, we're, we're just not going to even... I'm getting frustrated. There's no ice cream. Do these people in Charleston not eat ice cream? What's the matter? And so... Anyway, but at this point, we're, we're kind of too far gone, and so we just decided we will get to the wedding site just really early and just kind of kill time until it starts. We pull in the parking lot, and I was actually kind of surprised by how many cars there were there and actually surprised by how many people that were dressed that looked like they were going to a wedding because I thought, well, why is everyone here so early? But then I thought, well, maybe there's another wedding here somewhere on the campus. No big deal. And so... I start walking uh, further towards where the ceremony is going to be, and I, I came across the bride, and I was kind of surprised that she was already ready and at a point where I might be able to encounter. And so I, I speak to her and you know, tell her how lovely she is and all this stuff. And so um, she, she made a statement, something along the lines of, yeah, and here we're getting ready to rock and roll here in just a minute. And I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, and she's just excited. And so I, I kind of walked, walked away from her and then... I finally, I passed the wedding director, and I said, what, what time does this wedding start? And I'm thinking, it's like an hour and a half later. It turns out it's like 15 minutes later. And all I could think was this. I was one ice cream cone away from ruining somebody's wedding. I mean, one Baskin-Robbins, and, you know, they'd be shacked up to this day. And so... Um, <laughs> Long story short, though, I, I, I missed out on my ice cream that day. I, I missed that opportunity, but the good news is I did not miss the wedding. I did not miss the wedding. And if I'm going to miss something, I would have much rather missed the ice cream because not all things are equal, are they? Missing all opportunities is not the same because all opportunities are not of the same sort. 
of the same importance. Hold that thought for a moment and let me encourage you to think with me about this. Those of you who are parents, regardless of your stage of parenting, whether your children are still in the home or they're out on their own and they've given you grandchildren, hopefully you realize this, that your children represent an opportunity. Now, sometimes you think maybe it's an opportunity to lose your mind, your money, your patience. It could be losing those things. But if you're a follower of Christ and you profess to be someone that is one who has a personal relationship with Jesus, hopefully you realize this and view your children as an opportunity that God is affording you to be able to invest in them, to love them, to guide them, to instruct them, that God is presenting you the greatest opportunity that anybody on earth has to try to guide and shepherd their hearts so that they become lifelong followers of Christ. Now, I realize we can't make that happen, but I do realize this. God is giving us, as parents, the opportunity to have the greatest role in shaping them, molding them, guiding them, so that they do make decisions where they become lifelong followers of Christ. That is an amazing opportunity. Unfortunately, it is an opportunity that entirely too many people who are wearing the Jesus jersey are squandering. Unfortunately, that's, that's not anything particularly old. This opportunity has been squandered for a long time. In fact, as we're working our way through the life of Samson, and we're going to see not only today but uh, next week as well, I really believe in Samson we see not only in him that his is a life where God gives significant opportunities that get passed over and squandered, but I believe that he earns it outright because his parents, I believe, squandered significant opportunities to help shape and mold the young man that he was so that it affected the man he became. We can learn not simply what they did, but I believe that we can learn from their experience. Join me in Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13. So we give thought to this golden opportunity that we are afforded as parents, as grandparents, as people who have proximity to invest in the life of children. That's a great opportunity, one that we hopefully do not want to miss that we do not want to squander. So what can we learn about that? Join me in verse 6. Let me just very briefly set the stage for you. Back in verse 1, we spent last week looking at the first five verses of this chapter, and we're introduced to a couple. The, the husband's name is Manoah. His wife is unnamed. They are barren, but God has sent an angel to speak to Manoah's wife to say that you are going to conceive and you're going to, by the power of God, have a son. This is a son that I have big plans for. I want the entirety of his life to be dedicated and consecrated to me. As such, he's going to be a Nazarite. And so one of the signs, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, but one of the, the signs of that is that his hair is never to be cut. So she's had this conversation with an angel that leads us through the end of verse 5. That leads us now to verse 6 of Judges 13, where we're told the woman went and told her husband. So she goes and tells Manoah, A man of God came to me, and he looked like the awe-inspiring angel of God. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. He said to me, You will conceive and give birth to a son. Do not drink wine or beer, and do not eat anything unclean, because the boy will be a Nazarite to God from birth until the day of his death. So hearing this, in verse 8, Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, let the man of God you sent come again to us and teach us what we should do for the, for the boy who will be born. So bear in mind, the angel has not come to him. He's come to his wife. And so having heard the, the report, he prays and says, Lord, could we, get, could we get a second opportunity? I'd like to be able to talk to this angel as well. Do we, need some, we need some more information. So verse 9 says that God listened to Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman. She was sitting in the field, and her husband Manoah was not with her, and the woman ran quickly to her husband and told him, the man who came to me the other day has just come back. So Manoah got up and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he asked, are, are you the man who spoke to my wife? I am, he said. And Manoah said, when your words come true, what will the boy's responsibilities and work be? And the angel answered, Your wife needs to do everything I told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine or drink wine or beer. 
She must not eat anything unclean. Your wife must do everything I have commanded. At this point, he asks for an opportunity to, for them, him, this angel to share a meal with him. The angel refuses, but uh, instead instructs them to offer a sacrifice, which is, is given uh, starting in verse 19, where Manoah takes a goat and a grain offering and offers them on an altar to the Lord. Verse 20 says, When the flame went up from the altar to the sky, the angel of the Lord went up and its flame. So this angel has disappeared now. And when Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell face down on the ground. The angel of the Lord did not appear again to Manoah and his wife. And then, then Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. He tells his wife in verse 22, We're certainly going to die because we have seen God. But his wife said, if if the Lord had intended to kill us, he wouldn't have accepted the burnt offering, the grain offering from us, and he would would not have shown us all these things or spoken to us like this. Verse 24, so the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson. So at this point in the story, we're finally going to get introduced to Samson. What I want to do is not to detract from the meaning of this passage. I think meaning in Scripture is one, but I believe application is, can be multifaceted, all sorts of ways that, that a text that means something can, can be applied. And I really believe, and I was really struck personally, in looking at the life of Samson, what the Scripture tells us, I believe, has significant application with respect to the whole idea of parenting. And it reminds us of the significant opportunity that we are afforded to help invest in and shepherd and protect from and guide to so that we can do everything that's available to us at our disposal to help them become lifelong followers of the Lord. It is my belief that effectively Manoah and his wife squander this opportunity. You're going to see that more fully next week, but I believe from what we're told here there's some important application that has Brass tack significance, certainly for those of us who are still in the active stages of parenting young children, but regardless of your stage, as a parent, as a grandparent, as a teacher, as someone who has proximity to children, whatever time it is that God affords you to invest in them, you don't want that to be squandered. So how can we prevent that? Based on what we see here, I would say to you, the first thing is this, you have to recognize God's voice. You have to recognize God's voice. Notice the details in this story. When God is wanting to do something in the life of Manoah and his wife, he sends a messenger with some big news. But to whom does the messenger go? Does it go to Manoah? No. The messenger, the angel, goes to Manoah's wife. She then tells Manoah, and then he goes and he prays to God and says, Hey, how about round two? I'd like to have a conversation myself. And the sense that you get is, you know, I don't know if this is legit or not. I don't know if I can believe her. I don't know if that's true. I need to have my, my own experience. So, um, but he doesn't want to say that. Instead, he says, uh, what might his work and responsibilities be? But the fact that, he, that all he's, he doesn't trust what his wife has said, that he wants to have his own experience, is communicated in the thought that when he does finally hear from the angel, the angel says exactly what he has already told his wife, who has already told him. But bear in mind, when God sent a message, he did not send it to Manoah. He sent it to his wife. Manoah says, hey, how about giving me an opportunity myself, Lord, that I might hear? And the angel comes again, but to whom does the angel go? It goes again to his wife. Do you think that God didn't have any idea that Manoah wasn't around? Because she's out in the field by herself. Do you think this caught God by surprise? No. No. Why do you think it was that God, when he was sending a message, he kept going to Manoah's wife? I think the reason you see is at the end of verse 21. As this angel has left... Notice how that verse ends. Then Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. Here, I believe, is why the angel kept going to Manoah's wife. Because Manoah wouldn't recognize and did not recognize if and when God spoke. I really don't believe if and when God spoke to him that he would recognize that this is God speaking and this is God saying something to me. And I think part of the reason that the opportunity that he and his wife had to invest in the life of Samson 
for kingdom purposes, for godly ways, yet squandered in part because I believe it was true of Manoah that this is a guy that really did not know when it was that God was speaking. And if God did, he wouldn't know that it was the Lord. I believe wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly that God speaks to us, that he speaks to those of us that have a relationship with him. And I, I believe as we, that he speaks to us through what he has written and secured for us to have access to. I believe that he speaks to us as we have an opportunity to talk to him in prayer and then listen as he speaks to us through his spirit. I believe that he speaks to us through other people, through circumstances, through all sorts of different ways. But I really believe that too many times that voice is missed because it is not identified. For, for some years, I, I would say I was kind of late to the whole texting thing. And um, you remember when, when texting really was first introduced, it used to be that you had to pay per text. And if you want to send a message, it was 333-577. And so, but then finally, smart came, phones came out. You had an actual keyboard that you could type with. And still, even after I had one of those, I, I didn't do much texting, most of the time opting to actually have a personal phone conversation. But those can eat up a lot of time. And sometimes, all you need to do is to just send a little message, you, just a little blip of information you need to pass off. You don't need a long, lengthy conversation. You just need to text. And so... In recent years, I, I get to the point where I, I have and I do text a fair amount. Maybe you're in the same boat. That being said, it's entirely possible that you struggle with something that I struggle with. Here's how it works. I'll be doing whatever I'm doing on, in any particular day, and I get a notification that I've got a text. And as I read the message, it's pretty clear that it's one of you. And you know that I know something about your circumstance. And so you're going through something and you're sending me this message about something. And I'm reading that and I know I need to respond. And I want to respond kindly, prayerfully, gently. But here's my problem. I don't know who it is. Because all I've got is the number. And if, if I haven't already saved the number in my phone, all I see is the, is the number. And I, I want to respond kindly. I want to respond as though I'm interested. But it's tough to sound like you care when you respond with, who is this? Right? So as best and as gently as I can, I, I try to say, who dat? Who dat? But you know one of the cures for that? is if you do this over and over and over and over and over again. Because you know what happens? Even if I don't add the phone to my phone book, I recognize the number. Plenty of times it is that God speaks and it's just like going over our heads. We're not paying any attention to it. He, he, he is communicating in real and significant ways, but so many times we don't, we don't pay attention to it. We miss it because we don't recognize his voice. And the surest way to fix that, the surest way to solve that is to start intentionally listening over and over and over and over again. That you actually spend time with what he is saying. That you actually talk to him and then give some quiet time to be able to hear as he's trying to speak to you because there's a ton of voices in your life. You've got family, you've got friends, you've got teachers, you've got culture, you've got media, you've got all of this stuff. And in this cacophony of voices, the, the still voice of God is often easy to, to get lost in the shuffle. But I'm telling you, the opportunity you have as a parent, as a grandparent, as someone who has an opportunity to invest in the life of a child, that opportunity will be squandered if you are not hearing from God. If you are not having opportunity for God to guide you so that you can share that guidance and input that guidance into the life of a little boy and the life of a little girl. If you want to squander the opportunity that children represent, well then don't recognize God's voice. But if you want to seize it, you better learn to recognize it. The second application I'd, I'd share with you is this. Assimilation cannot be the goal. Assimilation cannot be the goal. Back uh, in these opening verses of chapter 13, as the messenger of God, as the angel shares about Samson and how he is going to, to be this Nazarite, that even from conception she's not to touch or eat anything unclean, never let, uh, let uh, a razor touch his hair, so she's hearing all of this stuff even from conception. But bear in mind that this 
particular passage comes in context as part of the overall story of the judges. And if you read the whole book of the judges, a statement you will see over and over and over again is this. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And, and even though you had this group of people, the Israelites, as the people of God, it was kind of like the people of God in name only. Because everybody's doing their own thing. They're making up their own rules. They're thumbing their noses at God's standards. They're ignoring the parameters and the boundaries and the guardrails that God has put up in life. And they're doing whatever it is that they want. And even though they're supposed to be the people of God, they don't look at all like it. They look exactly like their pagan neighbors. And it's into that culture, it's into that circumstance that God says to Manoah's wife, listen, you're going to have a son. Miraculously, you're going to have a son that I've got big plans for. I want to use the totality of his life in significant ways. However, I want you to be mindful that this child, from this point, um, from conception forward, is different. And is going to be different. And in fact, I even want him to look differently. So that if people don't know anything about Samson, they're going to know this. This whole idea of, of a Nazarite, this is not the first time. Samson is not the first Nazarite. He wasn't going to be the last. And so even if people didn't know anything about Samson, they would know just by looking, hey, this is a guy that has a, a close connection with God. This is a guy whose life is different. This is a guy whose life is set apart. And God wanted Samson's parents from the outset to have this awareness, our boy needs to be different. Our child needs to be different. Hear me when I say this. I am not suggesting, for those of you who are in the active stages of parenting, to say to you uh, grandparents as influencers or as teachers that the goal should be for your child, for your grandchild to be a weirdo. The goal is not for them to have some funky haircut and look like Crystal Gale. Some of you will have to Google that later, but anyway. I, I'm not suggesting that at all, but I am saying this. The culture that we're operating in looks an awful lot like that of the Day of Judges, where everybody is doing what is right in their own eyes. And it's in, that, it's in that environment that we're trying to do this whole thing of following Jesus. And being mindful of that, you have to make the decision that assimilation and my kid just fitting in, that can't be my goal. My goal has got to be something very different, that I want them to be a lifelong follower of God's. Isn't that the stated goal that's given here? At the end of verse 7, this boy will be a Nazarite to God from birth until the day of his death. The Lord wanted for Samson to be a lifelong follower of his. And to be a lifelong follower, assimilation can't be the goal. You've got to be different. You've got to operate different. You've got to have different priorities. How time is used. How, how money is spent. What kids are able to watch, whether it's in the movie theater or online. Friends that they're able to spend a lot of time with. Technology that they're able to be exposed to. Listen, assimilation and just being like everybody else, that emphatically cannot be the goal. When Paul says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, that communicates that believers are to be different. And if you don't want to squander the opportunity that God affords you in the presence of your child or your grandchild, you've got to say, listen, my goal is, my ultimate desire is for them to be a lifelong followers of the Lord. And so that means whether or not they fit in, that's not my goal. My goal is for them to know Christ to experience him and to be transformed by him for the whole of their life. You've got to recognize God's voice. Assimilation can't be your goal. Here's the final thought I'd give you, and it's this. You have to sweat the small stuff. 
You have to sweat the small stuff. Now, the cliche tells us, don't sweat the small stuff. There's tons of stuff that is just too insignificant to pay attention to, too inconsequential to matter. Pay attention to a little detail that's afforded us in this passage. They've had this amazing encounter where God has sent a messenger, has sent an angel to tell Manoah's wife and then him about this miracle child they're going to have. So that they've had repeated conversations, repeated encounters. There has been this sacrifice, this offering that has been given. The angel has gone away from them. They realize, hey, this is from God. Manoah's wife does, as the days turn into weeks, she starts to, to feel pregnant. She is pregnant. She gives birth. She has a son. And then we're told this in verse 24. She named him Samson. You don't have to be around a Bible very long especially to pay attention to the left-hand side of the Bible very long at all, before you realize names matter in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. You, you didn't wind up just by, by chance or with a fluke that happened to have a name, generally. It's typically for a reason that someone had a name. And the word that is rendered to us here as Samson is a diminutive form of a word that means son. So it could be translated little Sonny. Not like Sonny and Cher or Sonny Osborne, that, how we use Sonny, but sun as in light. Now it's easy to say, well, okay, well, that, that big deal. They, they named this, this child after, after light. But here's the interesting thing. We, we're told some details back at the beginning of this chapter. We know where all this is occurring. It's in the territory of Dan, we're told that this is occurring in the town of Zora. Next to Zora is an area, a town, that uses the same word that's translated as Samson. That word is Shemesh, means sun or light. The town next to them is Beth or house of Shemesh. It was a Philistine town that never got conquered by the Israelites. It was a town that was replete with a, and filled with a solar cult. By that I mean this was a town that was filled with people where the God they worshipped was the sun. Isn't it interesting that God gives them this, this child, this miraculous child, and they are just, I mean, it, it, it would be like us here within the city limits of Greensboro and High Point is just up the street. That, that, that's how close they are to each other. And they named this child Shemesh, which is exactly like Beth Shemesh just around the corner. So I'm going to name him Sun or Light, just like the house of light around the corner where they, oh, by the way, worship the sun. If you were to come up with a, a parallel, it would be like me, for example, as someone who says, I'm a follower of Jesus, naming one of my boys Muhammad. It would be like me naming one of my sons Joseph Smith, the leader or the founder of the Mormons. It'd be like me naming one of my children Baal, Molech. You can argue, well, it's just a name. It's just a name after all. But bear in mind that every time this little boy hears his name, it is reinforcement of a Philistine influence that's just around the corner where, oh, by the way, they happen to be worshiping a false god. And I have heard that this child is to be set apart, this child is to be different the entirety of his life, and I'm going to name him with the same word that the people right around the corner are using to worship an idol, a false god? You could, you could say it's just a name. It's just a name. It's, it's not that big a deal. But inconsequential things can absolutely matter. Let me give you an example. Every one of us has pet peeves, right? Uh, some of us have longer lists of pet peeves than others, but th the something that really gets on my nerves is this. If I walk into our kitchen, it's not simply if there are dishes in the sink, but if there are dishes in the sink where it's standing in water. 
because I know if it's standing, if they're standing in water, what is going on. Uh, our, our kitchen, there, it doesn't have a disposal, and so what we have is one of these uh, little filters that we'll put in, in the drain to catch stuff so that it's not going down, uh, down into the plumbing and causing a, a blockage or anything like that. And so the, the problem is that people will put a plate, a bowl, or something in there, and it gets kind of rinsed off, and all that, that particulate begins to, to get stuck in, in this filter. And people will they'll put all kinds of junk in there and all of a sudden water begins to start standing and I, I seem like I invariably find it and it, when I see that it just drives me crazy because I know among other things I gotta put my hand in this nasty water and fish out all this pieces of oatmeal and hunks of tomato or cheese or all this other muck that's in there can't stand it. it's aggravating nasty I don't like it here's the thought that thing gets clogged by, it, it's not one big thing that's in there. It's not a grapefruit peel that has covered the whole thing. It's some flecks of oatmeal. It's some pieces of tomato. It's some little shreds of slaw. It's some bean. That in and of itself is not that big, but they continue to accumulate so that finally there's, there's a complete blockage. Here's my encouragement for you. Parents, grandparents, teachers, those of you that have the opportunity to influence for Christ, children. You have to sweat the small stuff. By that I mean you still have to pay attention to the stuff that on the surface doesn't seem like it matters because in the end, it all matters. I, I realize in the process of swinging at everything, there's going to be some misses. It happens for me, it happens for us. We're not perfect. We're in this just like everybody else. But hear me in this. We've got to swing at everything because everything ultimately matters. And these little small things, they accumulate over time and become big problems. For example, in the scheme of things, it's not, is it a big deal that your child has technology? That they've got a phone in their pocket? Is, is, is that a big deal? Well, no, it's not necessarily a big deal, but that gives them the... the that's a window that the world has into their mind, to their heart, to their life. That when you're not around, they're able to communicate with only God knows who. Well, the fact that they've got a TV in their room, in and of itself, is that a particularly big thing? But again, that's another window of influence into their heart and life. Your child gets to, to talk or chat or text with hours throughout the course of a day with, with someone that you can say, well, it easily doesn't matter. It's not that big of a deal that I know who that person is or what it is they're talking about, but it does matter. Your, your kids may hear about God here at church, but they never hear about the Bible. They never hear about the Lord in your home and say, well, it's, it's, it's not that big a deal, but I'm telling you, it matters. Your son your daughter has developed feelings for some other boy for some girl and that they've got a girlfriend now and and this person does not know Christ this person does not walk with Jesus and you say well it you know it's not that big of a deal it's just a boyfriend it's just a girlfriend but you know what those girlfriends become wives and those boyfriends become husbands don't tell me it doesn't matter because it does Listen, we've got to start sweating the small stuff because the small stuff accumulates and becomes big stuff. You're going to see it next week as you have uh, Samson becoming now a young man and something as basic as a, his, th their son marrying a pagan. They don't stop. In fact, ultimately, they wind up greasing the tracks for that. How does that occur? It, it, it happened because bit by bit, the small pieces, the small things, ah, it's not that big a deal. It's not that big a deal. It's not that big a deal. It con t continues to accumulate, and ultimately, the opportunity to make a significant difference gets squandered. I realize, and we live absolutely as parents of a whole stack of children in a constant environment of work. I know that it is tiring. That's why, among other things, God doesn't give us children as senior adults, right? He gives them to us when we're, when we're young and dumb. It requires a lot of work. It requires diligence. It requires regular, consistent, and diligent work. It requires sweat, excuse me, it requires 
sweating, even the small stuff, unless, of course, it doesn't bother you. Unless, of course, if it isn't of consequence whether or not your son, your daughter, is a lifelong follower of Christ. My hope is you say it matters. And if it does, don't squander the opportunity. Will you bow your heads with me? Some of you here this morning are like me and Caroline in the sense that you're still very much on the front rows, active stages of parenting. We've got everything from a eight-month-old to a 13-year-old. A lot of stuff we're actively having to do. Some of you, you've got, you've got older kids. Maybe they're off in college. Maybe they're living on their own. Maybe they're married. Maybe you've got grandkids, great-grandkids now. I, I don't know. But I do believe sincerely that one of the greatest opportunities that God affords us is children. Not simply to love, not simply for companionship, not simply to pass on a name or legacy to build relationships with, but so that they might be those that come to know and walk with Jesus the entirety of their life. That doesn't happen by chance. It doesn't happen when those closest to them don't know and can't distinguish God's voice. That type of thing doesn't happen when what matters most is looking like everybody else at school. That doesn't happen when, when the list of small stuff keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger so that we're effectively not paying attention to much of anything. Maybe it is that God has shown you Showing you and your spouse today, hey, listen, there's some stuff that needs to change in our home. It's not going to change overnight, but today can be the beginning of it. It's going to require a choice, though, on your part. It's going to re require some effort that starts today. Listen, some time has already passed. The window is closing to influence. So are you going to change? I can't tell you exactly from here what that is. If you need some help, We'll be glad to help you, to assist you, to talk with you. But at the end of the day, it's going to be between you and the Lord. Am I, as a mom, am I, as a dad, going to fully seize this opportunity God's affording me? Maybe you're here today and you saw some children today, through symbols, experiencing something that you haven't. And I don't mean it is that you haven't been baptized, but I mean that this whole idea of having a personal relationship with God you can't say, I've got that. I've experienced that. In just a moment, we're going to have an opportunity where you can begin to come to know what it's like or how it is you can experience that. We're going to have a time of decision, and I, I hope that you would just step out from where you are. Come share that with me, and we'll begin a conversation. Or if you're petrified of that, see me, see Jamie afterwards. We'd love to be able to talk with you so that you can come to experience what we have, what even these young men and women have already experienced. It'll change your life. It'll change your eternity. I just believe that every time we open God's Word, He through His Word, He through His Spirit speaks. He's saying something to you. The question is, are you going to do what He's saying? Father, we are grateful to you for the fact that you do speak. That you didn't just spin the world into existence and walk away. That what is going on in our Existence. It matters to you. It is of consequence. You've got plans and purposes for us. You afford us opportunities like the amazing opportunity to shepherd the hearts of children. And I pray, Lord, that we realize the greatness and significance of that opportunity. And we take it seriously so that the opportunities to point them to you, towards you, that doesn't get squandered. So, Lord, as you've spoken to our hearts today and call us to make decisions, I pray that we'll follow your lead. We ask this of you in Christ's name. Amen. I'm